Hello and welcome. Let's talk chemical senses. Let's talk chemical senses now. Let's go through and we're going to look at a couple of different senses. And here when we go through and we talk chemical senses, chemical senses we're going to look at are going to include the senses uh, in relation to smell and uh, the sense taste. So let's go through and let's look at both of these senses there. Again, this is the anatomy, so we're going to go through and we'll check out the anatomy. Uh, I'll hit at a little bit of the physio there, but it's nothing uh, uh, that you have to know or you'll be responsible for knowing about or um, you'll have to know in great detail. Um, when you get to physio, then obviously you'll see that in greater detail and you'll get there. So here let's move through. And let's get slideshow opened up. Let's play this from the current slide. All right. So here we're going to go through and what. We'll uh, talk about uh, this first chemical sense. This first chemical sense will be uh, the chemical sense uh, of smell, uh, the, the sense of smell. Now, when we go through and we talk about uh, the sense of smell, the sense of smell is going to be elicited thanks to, you'll see, our olfactory epithelium. Thanks to our olfactory epithelium. Now, when we go through and we talk olfactory epithelium, this olfactory epithelium is going to be found occupying basically the olfactory mucosa. So when we talk olfactory mucosa, the olfactory mucosa itself is going to be found now lining. You'll see the roof. It says the roof of the nasal cavity here in your guys' slides. Um, again, now when we go through and we talk uh, nasal cavity, we're going to talk specifically, specifically speaking, we're going to see it's going to be found lining the superior nasal conche on both sides. Lining the superior nasal conche on both sides. So here when we go through and we talk, you can see that there in greater detail now. Here you've got the superior nasal concha. We've talked about these nasal concha when we talked bones. We referred to them as scroll-like structures. Okay, and then they've got meatuses, little uh, canal-like uh, passageways underneath, and they're going to be involved with helping to create turbulence in the air that we breathe. So here when we talk uh, uh, concha, you can see all three concha, and we've got the superior, our reference point for the sense of smell now. So again, here we've got what we call our olfactory mucosa. The olfactory mucosa contains this olfactory epithelium. Let's look at this now in greater detail. Now, while we're here in this image, I want to point out to you as well, um, we're not going to just look at this one part and just talk about this and just you know leave this alone. I want you to look at everything, right? There's a picture, so I want you to go through the picture and look at everything there. Now, the sense of smell, the sense of smell is going to take place inside the nasal cavity. But now here you can see the nerve that's making its way to that nasal cavity is coming from, you can see the cranial cavity. So you've got a cranial cavity, you can appreciate right in here. You've got then the nasal cavity. And then here you've got oral cavity. So you've got three different cavities I want you to be able to uh, put together there as well. And then we're going to go through and we're going to look at uh, all these other structures uh, throughout the semester as well. But here you can appreciate one bone. You should know this bone here. Not only that, you should know this bone that you have here. And you should see and be able to identify this bone you have here as well. So uh, not only that, but then we've got these bones down here. So these are all going to be creating different boundaries. You could think of borders from one cavity to another. So here we've got the sphenoid bone. Okay, here we've got the frontal bone. And between the two, you've got the ethmoid bone. If you recall, we had the name of that uh, structure uh, that has the openings. Very good. I know you're all guessing it right. Cribiform plate with the olfactory foramina or cribiform foramina, right? Now, here you can see we've got which bone? Okay, we all know what bone that is. Uh, it's got a specific name to it, okay? Uh, you would want to know the name to that. And then here we're going to have another bone that's going to help make up then the posterior one-third you could think of of that hard palate. And that's going to be... I'm 100% sure we all know the name of that bone there as well. But again, more specifically speaking, what's the name of that specific spot of that bone? Okay. So here you can see then you've got basically that nasal cavity. And we'll discuss the nasal cavity and its boundaries, borders, and all of that in greater detail when we get to uh, respiratory system. So looking here now, you can appreciate that olfactory epithelium. Now, this olfactory nerve we've got there, we've talked about that nerve there as well. We said this is cranial nerve number one. Here you can see it's got two parts to it. It's got a track, and then you can see the bulb part. I told you guys before, we'll look at the inside and we'll see what that uh, uh, 
is what that create what basically is helping to create that bulging part or that bulb part of that nerve there as well when we move through <coughs> excuse me through here so let's zoom in on that when we zoom in on that region there this is what you see so higher power this is what you've got there again now let me reorient you to where we're at you've got cranial cavity up in here cribiform plate of the ethmoid bone and then right down here you've got nasal cavity so you can see here those tiny openings you've seen them when we talked bones and we went through all of that in the beginning of the semester let's talk then this olfactory epithelium now when we talk olfactory epithelium this olfactory epithelium you can see it's made up of a couple of different or a few different cells now the major cell type that we have here that we're going to talk about we're going to check out is going to be the olfactory sensory neurons or you can refer to them as the olfactory receptor cells now when we talk about these olfactory receptor cells or these olfactory sensory neurons you can see those cells here very nicely in yellow these cells they're described they're described as being bowling pin shaped cells bowling pin shaped cells they're found in that olfactory epithelium this olfactory epithelium we said is found located high up in that nasal cavity in the roof of the nasal cavity covering the superior nasal concha on each side of that nasal septum so that epithelium has got one major cell type here that we can see and that's the olfactory sensory neurons now these olfactory sensory neurons so again they're going to be found making up that epithelium which covers the superior nasal concha now these olfactory receptor cells these olfactory receptor cells these cells you'll see they are number one they're unusual bipolar neurons if you recall we talked about having bipolar neurons in a couple of different places a couple of main places where i'd like you to know about and we've hit at now both of those Next thing you can see, each of these cells, each uh, of these uh, olfactory sensory neurons, these receptor cells, they have a thin apical dendrite. Here you can appreciate that thin apical dendrite. You can see that here for this neuron. Same thing, same thing here for this one. Same thing here for this one. Here, here, and here as well. Now these apical dendrites, these apical dendrites, they're going to terminate. They terminate... They terminate as these widened out knob-like structures. The dendrites, these thin apical dendrites, they're going to terminate as these widened out knob-like structures you can see right here at the end, from which you're going to see several cilia radiate, from which you can see several cilia radiate. Now this cilia, this cilia you'll see is going to be a little different from the cilia that we've talked about and we've mentioned throughout the semester. Normally speaking, we've seen cilia to be erect. Here you see it's not erect. It's found lying flat against the epithelium. And also epithelia, uh, you can see that and when we talk cilia, we said cilia is going to help to move things along. So here you see it's not helping to move things along. Here it's going to serve as, we'll see here in a few seconds, as, a, as basically the receptive area. So let's talk olfactory cilia that's next on your note taker now we talk olfactory cilia this olfactory cilia what it does is it increases it increases the receptive surface area it increases the receptive surface area and again like i said you can see it's going to be found lying flat against it's found lying flat against that nasal epithelium against those uh, epithelial cells, against that olfactory epithelium. Now here when we go through and we talk uh, this uh, cilia, you can see the cilia is also coated. It's also covered by a thin coat. It's covered by a thin coat of mucus. This mucus is a solvent. The mucus is a solvent. And what this mucus does is it's going to capture. It captures and it dissolves airborne irritants. It will capture and it will help dissolve airborne irritants. Now when we go through and we talk uh, mucus, this mucus is going to come from, we can see these glands. Here we've got 
olfactory glands. These olfactory glands, they're going to help produce the mucus along with the supporting cells. So they'll produce the mucus along with the supporting cells. And these glands, they're found, as you can see, in the underlying connective tissue. They're found, <coughs> excuse me, in the underlying connective tissue. So you can see that right underneath here. Again, remember we talked epithelia, we said epithelia's got uh, all these different characteristics, and one of those characteristics is it's supported by connective tissue, and that's what you got right there. Now, here you can appreciate the gland. And here you got the, the duct of the gland, and so allow it to introduce its secretions to the surface or into a cavity. So what type of a gland are we talking about here? Very good. That duct gave it away. You're talking about exocrine glands. Exocrine glands. So next then let's move and let's talk then the filaments. Here you can see the filaments of olfactory nerve, cranial nerve number one. Here you can see now the filaments of cranial nerve number one. They're basically these slender, unmyelinated axons. They are slender, unmyelinated axons of the olfactory receptor cells. Of the olfactory receptor cells that are going to collect, that are going to collect. You can see here and gather before they penetrate through the foramina. So when we talk filaments, filaments of cranial nerve number one, they're slender, unmyelinated axons of the olfactory receptor cells that are going to collect and gather right before they penetrate through this cribiform plate via those olfactory foramina or Cribiform foramina. Now you can see these fascicles, they're going to, these filaments basically, they're going to project superiorly. So they project superiorly through the openings, through the foramina, cribiform foramina, on that ethmoid bone. Now, I told you that olfactory nerve is going to have some subdivisions to it. We saw the tract, and then here we can see the bulb. Now, the bulb, you can see the inside. Now, the bulb is a widened out region, and you can see why it's widened out. It's widened out because you can see here, we've got a junction. We've got a junction between the axon of one cell and the dendrites of another cell, from one neuron to another neuron. So here what we have is we have these axodendritic synapses. Okay, synapses, where two cells come together. So here you can see exactly that happening. Now this cell here, multipolar cell, multipolar neuron, specifically speaking, it's a mitral cell. And now these signals are going to be basically traveling in between these two cells, you can see. So the olfactory bulb is basically found at the distal ends. It's the widened distal ends of that olfactory nerve you can see right there. And then tract, I've given you the definition of tract. And so that's exactly what you're seeing here. And then we've got supporting cells here. These supporting cells are columnar cells. They are columnar cells. And they make up, you can see, they make up the majority they make up the bulk. They make up the majority of this penny thin. It's like as, as, as thin as a penny. So again, they're going to be making up the bulk of this penny thin epithelial membrane. Of this penny thin epithelial membrane. And then we can also see their basal cells. Basal cells are going to be dynamic stem cells. And so here what happens then, you've got the anatomy laid out here. What's going to happen is uh, odorants. 
Odorants are going to come in, excuse me, odorants will come in, and when odorants come in, odorants will dissolve in this mucus, and they'll go and they'll bind to receptors that are going to be found on the olfactory cilia. So that's why I told you the cilia is a little bit different from the cilia that we've described before. So these odorants come and they bind to these various receptors, and when they bind to the various receptors, then they'll excite these cells. These ex cells then will, say, get excited. They're going to start sending signals basically to the next cells, eventually letting the brain know what we have there that we're smelling. And then physio, you'll see we get into it in full-on detail where you can actually see the receptors and the odorants and you see the connection between the two help to activate a whole bunch of different, uh, uh, you can think of uh, activities inside the cell which are going to then allow us to be able to smell what we're smelling. Not only smell what we're smelling, but also to help create adaptation. So you don't just keep smelling the same thing with that same intensity over and over, right? When somebody comes uh, with this new cologne after a few minutes, uh, the initial, uh, you know, that initial smell is a pretty strong smell. But after that, uh, you know, you stop smelling it. And that's going to be due to adaptation. And you'll do different activities there as well, where you'll try to uh, see how long it takes for you to adapt. Next, then let's move from sense of smell. We'll move to the next sense. That's, this will be taste. But let me go through the different processes that are taking place here. You can see now first the odorants will come in. The odorants come in and they'll bind to the receptor. Once they bind to the receptor, what's going to happen is they'll activate this G protein linked receptor system, which you can see here now this GTP gets activated. This olfactory protein gets uh, basically gets activated and it's going to activate now you can see adenylate cyclase. So there's an enzyme here. This enzyme, what it does, then it converts ATP to cyclic AMP. Now cyclic AMP, then what it does, it goes and it binds to these receptors, these channel receptors. When it binds to these channel receptors now, here you can see what it does. It helps to open up that gated cation channel. And you'll learn and you'll see when these ions move across the membrane. If you haven't learned in 107, right, when you talk to action potentials, you'll see this in physio and you'll get this down there. This will help to create then an action potential. As you can see here, leading to the first part, depolarization. So the cell depolarizes when that sodium is going to rush into the cell. Now, when we go through and we talk about the sense of smell, I want you guys to know this uh, is one of the senses where signals are not going to pass through the thalamus. They do not pass through the thalamus. Okay, before stimulating the primary olfactory cortex. Everything else we've seen, we said that the thalamus is going to serve as our relay station. It serves as our relay station. So since it serves as a relay station, for we said also incoming signals. So here you can see is where one sense is not going to be sending in signals through the thalamus. So secondary areas are going to include, then you can see, insula, the orbital frontal cortex, hippocampus, amygdala, and the hypothalamus. And then here you can see all those passageways. Let's talk gustation. Let's talk taste. Now we talk gustation. We talk taste. Taste is going to take place inside the oral cavity, more specifically speaking, on the tongue. And we'll see other areas in that oral cavity as well. Most, uh, we'll say primarily inside the, on the tongue, because on the tongue is where we're going to find taste buds. And that's where the sense of taste is going to occur. So taste buds, tongue is going to have most of them. There's some that are going to be found in the soft palate, the pharynx, the epiglottis, and also the cheeks as well. So that's why I said primarily tongue. Now, these papillae we're going to go through, we're going to check out, are going to be various papillae. Now, they're referred to as your lingual papillae. They're going to be projections on the surface of the tongue. Now, you can see there's various types. We have fungiform. We have foliate. We have valet or circumvallate. And we have filiform. 
filiform have no buds inside of them. They have no taste buds. They're going to be involved with basically, uh, we're going to talk about them in digestion. Okay, we're going to see that they're going to be involved with helping to basically uh, uh, give us a little bit of texture kind of taste there. And um, they'll be involved with uh, kind of helping to manipulate food basically. Now the other three we can see here, they're going to have taste buds, the foliate. They're going to be basically containing buds in children. We can see then the fungi form will have buds there and then the valet will have buds there as well. We're not going to go through every single one of them. What we'll do then is we'll look at, you can see now the various types. First here we've got the fungi form. Fungi form, now we're going to see, are going to be found scattered over the entire tongue surface. The fungi form are going to be scattered over the entire tongue surface and they are mushroom shaped. They are mushroom shaped papillae. Next up we have our foliate, papillae, foliate, papillae are going to be found on the lateral aspects of the tongue, found on the side walls, found on the side walls. And then we have our valet or circumvallet papillae. So taste buds, you can see fungiform and foliate. And then we said here, fungiform, foliate, and the third, the valet or circumvallet, they're also known as, as well. So circumvallet, found forming an inverted V, found forming an inverted V at the back of the tongue. There's about seven to 12 of them, about seven to 12, valet or circumvallet papillae, found forming an inverted V at the back of the tongue. So let's look at one, uh, one of their structures. Here we can see the circumvallet. So here you can see right on the sides, you've got these taste buds. So what we'll do is we'll look at one of those taste buds and we'll examine that in greater detail. So let's move from this picture over to this picture here as well. So here now when we look at the structure of a taste bud, you can see they're going to be made up of gustatory cells or your taste cells. Now these are types of epithelial cells. These are types of epithelial cells and you can see they're going to be found making up the majority of these taste receptors, these uh, taste buds, we can say there. All right, so talking about these gustatory cells, you can see these gustatory cells are going to be found distributed among some supporting cells. So some of these cells will be supporting cells and other cells will be gustatory taste cells. Now these gustatory cells are these taste cells. They're epithelial cells. They're a type of epithelial cell and you can see they're going to make up the taste bud along with supporting cells. Now when we talk these uh, gustatory cells, these gustatory cells, now we can find these uh, gustatory cells, basically you can see here and we've got these uh, nerve fibers coming in and then they'll be penetrating basically and innervating uh, these uh, gustatory cells. So whenever those gustatory cells get excited, those gustatory cells are going to stimulate basically those cranial nerve fibers and then sending signals to, you know, then uh, basically to the cortices to just sum that up real quick. Now again, I was going to say to the different nerves, so depending on which part of the tongue you're at, so to be that specific nerve, and then eventually making its way to the brain. Now, here when we go through, we look at one of the one taste button, we look at its structure. Now I want you guys to see here, what we could see is we could see first a taste pour. Now here we've got a taste pour. The taste pour is going to be an opening. It's a neck-like opening, it's a neck-like opening, to each of the taste buds. And it's going to allow now those taste stints that are going to be coming, making their way in with saliva, basically allowing them to make their way into the sensitive, the receptor portion, which we're going to see is going to be the gustatory hairs. So the taste pour is going to be important because it's going to allow the taste stints to make their way and come into contact now with those gustatory hairs the receptive portion. Next in here we also have our gustatory hairs. So when we talk gustatory hairs, these gustatory hairs are long microvilli. They're going to be long microvilli. 
And you see the same thing right inside of here as well. They are long microvilli. They're long microvilli that are going to be found projecting from the tips of all gustatory cells. They're found projecting from the tips, you can see, of all of those gustatory cells. Again, they are the sensitive portion. They are the sensitive portion. They contain basically the receptor membrane. So that is what the tastants are going to come and bind to. Then again, you can appreciate those taste cells. And you can see how then they are innervated. And then as soon as they get excited, they will then send signals along these sensory nerve fibers. Now in physio, you guys will do a lab and you'll see the importance of saliva. Now without saliva there, it takes, uh, you'll see uh, tasting is close to impossible basically because the saliva is there to help guide, take, basically be the medium, take this taste in to the sensitive portion. Now again, you also have basal cells here as well. Again, dynamic stem cells. So dynamic stem cells, they differentiate and divide into new gustatory cells. And then taste fibers, cranial nerve fibers is what you see there. And then depending on which uh, part of the tongue you're on, right, or which part of the oral cavity you're at, then uh, because if we talk tongue, you got the anterior two thirds, the posterior one third, or uh, the anterior. Uh, uh, two-thirds posterior one-third and then you've got the most dorsal portion and the pharynx included there as well the epiglottis again that's going to contain uh, some of these uh, taste buds there as well so we talk taste in the oral cavity let's move then from taste let's move over to we'll see hearing and before we jump down here you can appreciate the pathway now so here you can see this pathway for the sense of taste is going to make its way right through the thalamus and then eventually to the specific areas of the cerebral cortex. Well, we've talked about those specific areas already when we talked uh, the cortices. So let's move then to hearing. Here you can see all the different nerves I told you you'll be responsible for knowing about there as well. Let's talk hearing. Let's talk ear. Now we talk ear. Ear, you can see here, this is a picture depicting the external ear, or one part of the external ear. Now when we go through and we talk ear, we'll look at the ear in a greater uh, idea. Basically, we'll get a greater idea of the ear when we look at this picture here. So here you can see and appreciate the ear in its entirety. Now, here we go through, we talk about the ear. You can see the ear is going to be get divided up into three different parts. You've got an external ear, you've got a middle ear, and then you've got the internal ear. Now, let's go through and let's talk each of these divisions one by one first. So, here first we'll start with external ear. Now, we talk external ear. The external ear is going to consist of a couple of major parts. You've got first the auricle, which you can see right outside of here. And then here we've got the external acoustic meatus. So, these two main parts are going to make up what we call our external ear. So again, it consists of the oracle and the external acoustic meatus. First, let's talk oracle. We talk oracle. The oracle is what we call the ear in layman's terms, right? We say ear, we refer to this as the ear. Uh, now, you can see that that's just one part of the ear. This oracle is a shell-shaped projection. It's a shell-shaped projection. It's also known as the pina. You can see here the pina. This shell-shaped projection is found surrounding the opening. It's found, you can see, surrounding the opening, which is the external acoustic meatus. So what this oracle or this pina does, it's a shell-shaped projection, it's going to help kind of funnel sound into that opening, into the external acoustic meatus. What type of uh, cartilage are we talking about here? Very good. Elastic. Remember, it's easy. It's elastic. Makes up the ear. And good job, the epiglottis. Very good. So here now when we go through, we talk uh, 
Oracle, you can appreciate that Oracle there. Now, in relation to the Oracle itself, we've got a few parts, but not just to the Oracle, but you can see to the external ear there as well. And let's go through these different parts here. Here you can first appreciate the helix, the helix. Now, the helix is, a, is, is, is thick. It's the thickened rim you can think of. It's the thickened rim right, of that oracle. It's a thickened rim of the oracle. This helix is going to project inferiorly to give rise to the lobule, to the earlobe, to the lobule. Lobule is the fleshy, dangling structure, fleshy, dangling structure. And you can see here, adipose. And then connected, basically connective tissue, support for the epithelial tissue right on top. Next here you have your tragus. Tragus, you can see, is going to help protect that external acoustic meatus, that opening. It's going to help protect that opening. Tragus is often pierced. And then here, across from the tragus, we can appreciate the anti-tragus. Both, again, helping to block off that entrance into the ear. And then we've got the anti-helix. So first we've talked helix. We can see across from the helix, we've got our anti-helix. So anti, usually you can see is across from the structure it's named for. And then here we've got the triangular fossa. You can see right above the anti-helix. Triangular fossa. And then we've got the concha on the other side. So it's when you stick your finger into your ear without sticking it into the external acoustic meatus. So all of this is all the concha. The concha. You can see that. I don't know why I'm showing it to you on me. You can see it clearly in the picture. Concha. And then you've got that opening, the external acoustic meatus. This external acoustic meatus is also known as the auditory canal. A.K.A. auditory canal. It's a very short, curved, it's a very short, curved tube. And it's going to extend from the oracle to the eardrum. Believe it or not, there's a wrong way and a right way to put your stethoscope into your ear. If you don't know what you're doing and uh, you don't uh, check your uh, technique, you can end up placing your stethoscope into the concha. If you place it into the concha, now there's no receptors here for hearing. So you have to make sure you push the ear buds away from you so that way they follow the contour of that external acoustic meatus. Your teachers can tell just from the way you put your stethoscope into your ear whether you know what you're doing with the stethoscope. So here you can see those sound waves are going to get funneled thanks to that external acoustic meatus into the tympanic membrane. So they're going to pass through that external acoustic meatus and they're going to come in and they're going to stimulate that tympanic membrane. So if you stick that uh, stethoscope into the concha, uh, it's difficult to hear what you're trying to listen to. Especially those sounds, the sounds of the heart or the sounds of the abdomen or the sounds of the lungs are already uh, sometimes pretty faint in some individuals. So external acoustic meatus, you can appreciate there. Now this external acoustic meatus is going to lead us to the eardrum as we described, to the tympanic membrane. Now, within this external acoustic meatus, you're going to be able to appreciate ceruminous glands, right? We've talked about these glands before. Now, ceruminous glands are going to be modified apocrine glands. They are modified apocrine glands, modified apocrine sweat glands, you can say more specifically, modified apocrine Now these glands, they're going to secrete a yellow-brown 
waxy material called cerumen. So they secrete a yellow-brown waxy material called cerumen or earwax. And earwax is important. Earwax is important because earwax is going to provide as a sticky trap. It will act as a sticky trap and help keep foreign bodies and also help repel insects. Doesn't always happen. I've removed uh, cockroaches, toys, even from people's external acoustic meatus, from children to adults. And uh, wax, I can't uh, begin to tell you how many times. Now, we've got the tympanic membrane then next. The tympanic membrane is also known as the eardrum. The tympanic membrane, you can see, is going to serve as the boundary. It's going to serve as the boundary between that external ear and the middle ear. So it's the border between the external and the middle ear. Let's move then to the middle ear. Here you can appreciate the middle ear, but what we'll do is we'll zoom in on the middle ear, and when we zoom in on the middle ear, we're going to be able to appreciate its structures in greater detail. So here you can appreciate its structures then in greater detail. Now here first we've got the middle ear. The middle ear I'd like you to know is also going to be known as the tympanic cavity, aka tympanic cavity. It's a small, air-filled, it's a very small, air-filled, mucosa-lined cavity. It's found in the petrous portion of the temporal bone. In that petrous portion of the temporal bone. Tympanic membrane we've already discussed there. You can appreciate now a round window and an oval window. The round window and the oval window are going to be openings. They're openings on the bony wall that lead us to the internal ear. Openings on that bony wall of the middle ear that will lead us to the internal ear. Now the oval window, you can appreciate underneath the stapes. So here you've got the stapes, one of the bones, the ossicles we'll discuss in the middle ear here in a few minutes. Round window, or oval window, and round window you can see here inferior to the stapes. So right underneath it, you got that oval window. So deep to the stapes, the oval window. And then here you can appreciate just inferior to it, you've got the round window. So this oval window is covered by the stapes. Now the round window is covered by membrane. It's going to be covered by membrane. This membrane is going to be basically a membrane that's going to act like a valve. What's going to happen is when the stapes hits up against that oval window, that's going to help to create a, a wave of basically a movement of fluid inside that ear. And that movement of fluid is going to happen efficiently if that round window is flexible and if it acts like a valve and allows basically that motion within the fluid to occur, we're going to be able to then hear the sound. So we'll check all that out as we progress. So I want you to know there are going to be two openings. However, they're covered, you can see. Next up we have our pharyngeotympanic tube. The pharyngeotympanic tube or the auditory tube, formerly known as the eustachian tube. If you're old school, we used to refer to it as the eustachian tube. It runs obliquely. It's found running obliquely. It runs obliquely downward. And it's going to link the middle ear. It will link that middle ear cavity you can see here. It will link that middle ear cavity to the pharynx. To, more specifically speaking, you'll see the nasal pharynx. To the nasal pharynx. Now, when we go to when we go to digest, no, when we get to respiratory, when we get to respiratory, we're going to look at the other end. We're going to see where it opens up at inside that nasal pharynx. So you can see here when we go up and down the hill, we want to equalize the pressure. Right? We'll usually plug our nose and. That's what that uh, helps us to do basically there. Let's talk then. Next, we've got our auditory ossicles. When we talk auditory ossicles, they are three of the smallest bones in the body. They're found in this tympanic cavity. And they're going to be named according to their shape. They will be named according to their shape. 
And a uh, question we can formulate here is uh, which skeletal division do they belong to? Very good. I know you got that right. Axial. So here we can see first we've got the malleus. Malleus is hammer shaped. The malleus is going to be found, you can see, one end of it articulating with the tympanic membrane, and the other end then you can see articulating with the next bone in line, which is going to be the incus. Now the incus is anvil shaped. It's anvil shaped. We talk anvil shaped, you can appreciate that there very well. It's uh, basically the structure that blacksmiths bend metal on and uh, do work on. Or a wrestler from WWF, if you remember. <laughs> Next that we have our stapes. The stapes, stapes, stirrup shaped, stirrup shaped. And you can see here it's going to be articulating with the incus on one end, and then it's covering that oval window on the other end. So three of the smallest bones you'll find in the body. Next, then let's move to the internal ear. Let's move to the internal ear. Now, when we talk internal ear, all right, so here we can see that internal ear. Now, when we talk this internal ear, we can see it's also going to be known now as the labyrinth. Internal ear will also be known as the labyrinth. If you look up the definition of labyrinth, it's tortuous maze, right, and so forth. So here, when we talk now this labyrinth, this internal ear, this internal ear is going to be found lying deep. It's found lying deep in the temporal bone behind the eye socket. Found deep in that temporal bone behind the eye socket. Now, this internal ear is going to get divided up into two different parts. Into two different parts. Now, to be able to appreciate these two different parts, what we'll do is we'll move over to this picture here. Now in this picture here you can appreciate the bony labyrinth and then you can see within the bony labyrinth is the membranous labyrinth. So first off let's talk bony labyrinth. Now when we talk bony labyrinth, the bony labyrinth is going to be this tortuous maze type pathway. It's a system you can think of of tortuous channels that's worming through the bone. So it's a, you can think of carved out part inside the bone. It's going to be filled with a fluid. The fluid it's going to be filled with is called perilymph. Now this perilymph is a fluid that's going to fill this bony labyrinth. It fills this bony labyrinth. And this perilymph is a fluid that's similar to and continuous with CSF. Next we have the vestibule. So here we'll move back. Now we move back here you can actually appreciate the vestibule. And coming back here you can see the vestibule then in greater detail. So moving back when we talk vestibule, vestibule is a central egg-shaped cavity of the bony labyrinth. Within this, sac uh, within this uh, vestibule we're able to appreciate the saccule and the utricle. So here's the utricle and here's the saccule within the vestibule. All within the vestibule. Now why is the saccule and the utricle important? Because we'll see within them are going to be the maculae. Our maculae. And we'll talk about our maculae in a few minutes. So saccule first. Saccule is the membranous labyrinth sac. It's a membranous labyrinth sac, as is the utricle. So utricle also, a membranous labyrinth sac. And they're both suspended in the perilymph. Right? They have perilymph around them. They're suspended within perilymph. And the reason why the sac and the utricle are important because they contain the maculae. The maculae are going to be equilibrium receptors. They are our equilibrium receptors. 
Let's move then to the semicircular canals. So here you can appreciate the semicircular canals. And now within those canals you can see are the semicircular ducts. Within the canals are the semicircular ducts. Now when we talk semicircular canals, semicircular canals are going to be found lying posterior and lateral to the vestibule. Lying posterior and lateral to the vestibule. And they're important because they contain the semicircular ducts. These ducts now, you can see have these ampullae to them. The ampulla. The ampulla is going to be the enlarged swelling. It is the enlarged swelling at the end of the semicircular ducts. So you can see one here for this anterior duct. You can see the same thing here for this lateral duct. And we're going to have the same thing right back here for this posterior semicircular duct. The ampullae are important because the ampullae are going to be receptors as well. Also, equilibrium receptors. So let's discuss the membranous labyrinth now. So we already took care of the bony labyrinth. Now when we talk membranous labyrinth, the membranous labyrinth is a continuous series. It's a continuous series of membranous sacs and ducts. Continued within the bony labyrinth. So a continuous series of membranous sacs and ducts continued within the bony labyrinth and following its contours. Now when we talk about this um, <coughs> membranous labyrinth, you'll see this membranous, membranous labyrinth is going to be filled with the fluid as well. This fluid here is going to be called endolymph. endolymph. Now endolymph is going to be chemically similar to potassium rich intracellular fluid. Similar to potassium rich intracellular fluid. And now this endolymph, this endolymph is going to be found in the interior of the membranous labyrinth. It's found in the interior of the membranous labyrinth. So here what we're going to do is we're going to look at this cochlea we'll go into first. And we'll look at the cochlea first, and then we'll jump into equilibrium. So let's look at the cochlea here first. Let's grab this part first, and here we can appreciate that cochlea. So here you can see what they're doing in this picture, in this image, is they're going to do a nice L cut, basically, to this cochlea. Now here with this cut, what this is going to allow us to do is it's going to allow us to appreciate, basically, the coils all the way through. So here what you really have is you have one cochlea, you can see here, that's continuous all the way through, all the way to the end. So here now you can see each of these regions of that cochlea themselves are divided up you can see into three different parts. So inside here you got three parts. You can have one part on the top you can see up here, one part in the middle which we see right here, and then the third part on the bottom which you've got right there. So let's unwind this cochlea Let's grab it, let's unwind it, and then we'll do one cut right through. If we're to do one cut right through, this is what you're going to have. Coming back, so let's unwind this snail-looking structure. You completely unwind it, pull it all the way open. Okay, so if you were to pull it all the way open, this is what we're going to have. You're going to have something that's going to look now like this. Does that make sense? Right? That's what you have here. Unwind it. This is what we're going to have. And now within it, within it, okay, so let's continue here. Pen color, let me switch to blue. 
just to depict the membranous labyrinth. You'll have something looking like this. Okay? So this is going to be segment one. Here is region two. And then down here we've got three, right? So unwinding this, in here would be like one, number two, and then number three. So let's do this. Let's move over here. Here you've got one. Here you've got two. Here you have three. So number one is known as the scala vestibuli. Scala vestibuli. In the middle, you got scala media. And then here on the bottom, scala tympani. Scala tympani. Now, scala media is important because we can see here is where we're going to find the receptor organ for hearing. This is the spiral organ, the receptor organ for hearing. So moving back, this is our image. That spiral organ, receptor hearing is all right in here. We basically, like you can think of right in here. All right in here. Okay? So, you can see there, scala vestibuli, scala tympani, in the middle, scala media. And then right here we've got the spiral organ, organ of corti, the sensitive uh, receptor region. So, here on the outside, we're going to have fluid, right? The bony labyrinth is what we described here. This is going to have perilymph, and then we said endolymph, and then perilymph. So you see that same thing being described here. Perilymph, perilymph, and the middle you got endolymph. Now look at here. These parts are continuous with each other. This is the apex. Right here. Apex at, the apex is found at the helicotrema, right? This area here is the helicotrema, and this is where you find the apex. So now here, let's continue to add in here. Here we have the round window covered by membrane. Now you understand why I said this is a valve? Does that make sense now? The fluid inside is what's going to be jiggling. And what do we say is going to be up here? So here we're going to have, I'm going to draw a little bit weird, but here's the stapes. All right, and then here we have the anvil, incus. Here we have the malleus, tympanic membrane, and then the rest of the ear. Right, and then the lobe and all of that is right out here. So when we talk sound, sound is vibrations of the air. These vibrations of the air are going to make their way into, we said, that ear. Eventually helping to get that tympanic membrane moving. When the tympanic membrane vibrates, the tympanic membrane is going to get the malleus to move. Malleus will hit up against the incus, which will hit up against the stapes, which is going to hit up against that oval window which will then get the fluid inside of here to eventually start moving. You see, it's like a domino effect is what we're trying to get. So now here, if we're going to see if sounds are of low intensity, those sounds are going to make their way through. They're going to come all the way through to the apex and then all the way around. They don't ever stimulate that spiral organ. That's why you don't hear them. But now if we talk sounds of higher intensity, those sounds, they're not going to be making their way all the way to the back. They're just going to come right through in here, and when they come in here, they're just going to get all of this in here to start vibrating. Now, why do we need all this here to vibrate? Because we're going to see that in a few seconds. Let's move over then to this picture here. So here you can appreciate the spiral organ. Look at the spiral organ. You've got the nerve. You've got these important cells in here and then some supporting cells there. And look at here. You've got a membrane on top and a membrane on bottom. You've got a tectorial membrane right here on top, and we've got a basilar membrane right down here. So you can see here that spiral organ is sandwiched in between those two membranes. So let's zoom in on that then. And this is what you see. You got your tectorial membrane, and down here you got the basilar membrane. 
So here you can see sandwiched in between them is two rows of cells. You've got one row of inner hair cells and three rows of outer hair cells. So here what happens now is when sound comes in, now you can see here to each of these hair cells you've got hair bundles. Those hair bundles are embedded within the tectorial membrane. So here what happens is now when sound comes in, so when sound comes in, sound is going to come in. We said it's going to go right through here. It's going to get that basilar membrane vibrating. Now when that basilar membrane starts to move, here you'll see it's going to get these cells, hairs to bend. And when those hairs bend, this will start to generate signals in the nerves and letting them, the ear, know this is what's going on. So that's how hearing is done. Next thing, let's talk equilibrium. So we make sure I've got everything with that cochlea. Coachella, one way you guys like to remember that. Hear, sound, Coachella, cochlea. So yeah, we got everything there. Let's talk then equilibrium. So when we talk equilibrium then, let's talk... So this is basically everything we just went through. You can kind of go through that. Okay, talking about the bending of the stereocilia, how it's going to open up ion channels, helping to trigger electrical signals. And then again, the pathway you can appreciate there as well. Let's talk then equilibrium. So equilibrium then we'll see is going to be a sense that not only depends on input from the internal ear. So it's a sense that's not only going to depend on in input from the internal ear, but also it's going to depend on information from vision. And it's going to depend on information coming from stretch receptors in relation to our muscles and our tendons. And also from our stretch receptors in relation to our muscles and tendons. Now here we have first our maculae. Our maculae are described as sensory receptors for static equilibrium. Sensory receptors for static equilibrium. When you talk about their function, their function is that they monitor the position of the head in space. They will monitor the position of the head in space. They also play a key role in posture. Where are they found? They're going to be found, as we described, one in each saccule and uterical wall. One in each saccule and utricle wall. Utricle. Now here when you look at the position, you can see how each of them are going to be found. One is vertically placed, one is a little bit more horizontally placed. So here now what happens is, like we described, they're going to monitor the position of the head in space. But not only the monitor, not only monitoring position of the head in space, also linear acceleration we'll see there as well. Linear acceleration, let's say you're standing here and all of a sudden you start to move forward fast. Right? This is linear acceleration. Even elevators, right, moving up and down an elevator. Okay, vertical acceleration. You've got happening there, but that's not that common. More is this, uh, you can see this linear acceleration. Next in here, when we go through and we talk uh, maculae, now what happens here, when we look at their structure, you can see here in greater detail, the maculae are made up of also supporting cells and hair cells. Now these hair cells have these hair bundles. Those hair bundles have, you'll see now, a whole bunch of stereocilia and a kinocilium. Stereocilia and a kinocilium. So that makes up a hair bundle. Those hair bundles themselves now are embedded within this otolithic membrane, this rocky membrane you see there. Otolithic, rocky membrane. So you can see that membrane is going to cover all of those hair bundles. So here now what happens is, as soon as you have the position of the head start to change, what this does, it's going to get those stereocilia and the kinocilium to start to bend. It gets those hair bundles to bend. So when those hair bundles start to bend, now depending on whether they're bending 
towards or away from the kinocilium, this will trigger then action potentials or signals along these nerves, letting then the brain know what's going on. So you can see exactly that happening. Here this individual goes from the seated position to where they put their head down a bit and this gets this otolithic mem membrane to start moving. Next then we have our Cristae ampullaris. Now the Cristae ampullaris are going to be receptors for dynamic equilibrium. Receptors for dynamic equilibrium. Their function is that they get stimulated by head movements. Now they get stimulated by head movements, but in this case, you'll see the majority, the major stimulus are going to be rotary or angular head movements. Rotary or angular head movements. Where are these receptors found? These receptors are going to be found in the ampulla of each semicircular canal, as we described. In the ampulla of each semicircular canal. Now here, what we have is, we'll move over to this picture, here what we have is, you can appreciate now, hair cells, again, hair bundles, okay? Again, supporting cells there as well. Now here you have a cupula on top. Here you have a cupula enclosing all those hair bundles. So now here what happens is you can see when we have these rotary movements, okay, these rotary movements are going to cause this endolymph to start to turn in the opposite direction. So here what happens is you can see now if we're going to be moving in one direction, this fluid is going to be moving in the opposite direction. And what that does, it gets basically this cupula to start to bend, and that's going to get those, again, same concept, hair cells, their bundles, their hair bundles to bend, and that's going to start then sending signals to the brain, letting the brain know, hey, we've got these rotary movements occurring. So that there then is equilibrium as well.